The title of our lecture is uh, Let the Children Worship, and there should be on the link below an outline to um, this lecture and a link to kind of uh, some further articles. There's lots of people who have written really helpful things uh, on this. At the heart of the Bible is a promise, and um, it's a song. You know the way that couples sometimes have um, your, their song? And in the Bible, God has a song for us. And here it is. It is, I will be your God and you will be my people. That is the theme tune of the Bible. I will be your God and you will be my people. So from Genesis 17 to Revelation 21, you'll find that refrain coming up again and again in the melody of the Bible. God pledges himself to his people. He says, I will redeem you by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I will save you by sending my son as a substitute. I will regenerate you by my Holy Spirit. I will bring you by the spirit of adoption into my family. I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. And I will love you and I want you to love me with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And so in this lecture, what what I want to do is I want to spend some time thinking uh, about that covenant because that covenant is the bedrock before we come to the issue of let the children worship. So what is a covenant? A covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. That's um, what O. Palmer Robertson tells us. It might not make it clear immediately, so let me try and explain more. A covenant is a bond. It's an obligation which God has towards his people. He binds himself to his people, and he binds his people to himself. It's a commitment, a marriage. That's what the book of Hosea teaches us. God has established a marriage relationship with his people to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And so that is why sin is so often seen in the Bible as spiritual adultery. It's a bond in blood. That's what a covenant is. And that tells you that issues of life and death are involved in making a covenant. The word actually for making a covenant in the Old Testament is to cut a covenant. It brings the association of shedding of blood. You cut a covenant. It is a pledge of of God's covenant with um, Abraham in Genesis 15. He binds himself to Abraham. And so you go to that passage in Genesis 15, and there's a cutting of the carcasses. And God God passes in between those pieces of seven animals. And God is saying wonderfully that what has happened to the animals will happen to me if I fail to keep any of my promises. It's a bond in blood. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar and on the people. In covenant ceremonies in Scripture, there was the shedding of blood. When you come into the New Testament and you go to the Lord's table, the Lord Jesus holds up the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And we know, don't we, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. It's a bond in blood, sovereignly administered. And so you notice that God is the one who takes the initiative. In Genesis 15, Abraham is actually asleep in a coma, and it is God who passes through the carcasses of the animals. It's not, and it never is, a covenant between equal parties. It is between Almighty God, the self existent God, and sinners. And God, in all his sovereignty, in all his power, is establishing a bond with his people. So let's try and see the extent of this in in the Bible. Don't get the impression that covenant is unimportant. There's a covenant with creation, isn't there, in Genesis 3. There's a covenant with Noah in Genesis 6 to 8 that there would never again be a worldwide flood. There was a sign and a seal of that covenant, the rainbow. Then in Genesis 15, you have the covenant with Abraham, Exodus 24, where God gives his law to Moses to Samuel 7, the covenant with David, Jeremiah 31, the promise of the new covenant. You come in the New Testament to the Lord's table and the cup of the new covenant. The cross is Christ taking upon himself the covenant curse. Wherever you look in the Bible, in all of God's dealings with sinners, it could be said to be covenantal. That is how God relates to you and I. 
And so let's just narrow down a little bit and see the thread of God's grace, God's unmerited favor that runs through all these covenants. Go back to the garden in Genesis 3.15. And God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So he's speaking to the serpent. And between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's a promise of grace. There's a promise of hope. There's the promise of a serpent crusher. You find it with Noah, where God saves Noah and his family. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see it with Abraham. God calls this man, this wealthy man, out of Ur and brings him into a loving relationship with him. He gives him a promise, and God says, I will bless you and your seed after you for a thousand generations. It's lavish grace. With Moses, there is this legal aspect to the covenant that it has law, but it's also full of promise. God has brought his people out of Egypt through the wilderness wanderings, and he brings them into the promised land. That is the promise. The grace of God. There were legal aspects, the Sinai, which were peculiar to the Old Testament, those civil laws and ceremonial laws, but they were a type. And they foreshadowed and pointed forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God was bringing his people out of darkness into the light. There's the thread of grace. There's the unity in the covenants. And that unity, if I can put it in this way, it refers to the Messiah principle. The Redeemer principle. Throughout each stage, whether it's in Eden or Abraham or Moses or Joshua as they're about to enter the land, whether it's with David or through the prophets, there is this principle, the Emmanuel principle, that God would come and be with his people. Come with me to um, Ezekiel 37 and, and verse 24 and following. These verses are, we often miss, but, but there's a wonderful picture of the unity of God's covenant in these verses. Exodus 36 and 37, God is is establishing his covenant with his people. And look at the language of these verses. Look at verse 24, Ezekiel 37. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. So there's David. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. There's Moses. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived, They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. What does that remind you of? That's Abraham, isn't it? Genesis 15. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in the land and multiply them. And will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them. And I will be their God. And they will be my people that's John 1.14, isn't it? Where it speaks of Jesus as the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Emmanuel principle that God has come to be with his people. And then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. When my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. It's covenant consummation. Revelation 21. So one theme throughout all the Bible And we must never lose sight of the unity of God's purposes. Throughout the whole of the scriptures, the New Testament means nothing without the Old Testament. I'm reading through Mark's Gospel with a group of non-Christian men at the minute. And it is impossible for them to understand Mark's Gospel properly without the Old Testament. The work of Christ is of little significance without the teaching that has gone before. God didn't come to a complete stop Um, at the end of Malachi, there is one theme, there's one song that God is determined wonderfully to be God to his people and to their children. So that leads us um, to think about the place of children in the covenant. We're getting nearer our theme. First thing we need to say, children are a blessing. Psalm 127, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. We should and we must rejoice in the provision of children. Our children must know in our families, in our churches, that they are a blessing. The second thing to say is that children are born in sin. They're depraved. They sinned in Adam and fell with him. 
They inherit the guilt and the corruption of Adam, fallen creatures. Their entire nature is influenced by sin. So what exactly does God say about children in the covenant? Let me try and give you an illustration. There's a wealthy man, let's say he makes an arrangement with his bank to provide him with a thousand pound a month um, every month for every year of the rest of his life. And then if he might, if it's legally possible after, after his death, that that thousand pound from his investment goes to one of his sons. And if it's legally possible, he makes provision that after his son dies, that thousand pound goes to his grandson. And then when he dies, to his great grandson. It's just an illustration. God has determined to relate to his people covenant, covenantally by making his arrangement a genealogical one. The administration of God's grace takes recognition of our children, of our seed. Now let me show you this. In the Garden of Eden, Adam's sin obviously affects his children, doesn't it? And God's promise in Genesis 3 affects Adam's children. In Genesis 6 to 8, with Noah, it is Noah and Mrs. Noah and his three sons and their wives that are saved. Obviously, God's covenant affects his children. In Genesis 17, verses 7 and 8, God says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings or the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Go to Exodus 20, the, the second commandment. Verses 5 and 6. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. That I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And I visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. But I show steadfast love to thousands of those who love and keep my commandments. Do you see there, in Exodus 20, there is both covenant blessing and covenant curse. There is promise and there is threat. There is benediction and there is malediction on genealogical grounds. The sins of the parents be visited on their children, but the blessings are also promised to the children. We see it in Deuteronomy, the book of the covenant, quite literally. The people of God are are in the plains of Moab. They're about to enter the promised land under Joshua, and they're about to renew the covenant. And so Moses instructs them in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, and he says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. It's the language of Abraham. Just a couple of chapters before, in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verses 2 and 3, you have this really key passage in thinking about the covenant. It says there, the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Not with our fathers, did the Lord make the covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face on the mountain, out of the midst of the fire. Do you see they're talking about the renewal of the covenant with Moses at Sinai? And now that this is telling us that that generation that were all alive at the making of the covenant with Moses, well, they've died in the wilderness. There might have been some little children still alive, but the vast majority died in the wilderness. But what Deuteronomy 5 says, it's very interesting that those who were not alive when the covenant was made with Moses, they were still seed, they were still unborn, they were yet unconceived. And yet, they say the covenant is made with them. The covenant is made with us, they say. And it underlines to us the fact that the covenant was made with those who are alive today. Can you see that the children of believers are included in the covenant? We could go on here and speak of the covenant signs of baptism and the Lord's Supper. I'd love to do that, but but we've not got time to do that. But I want you to grasp the point that children are included in God's covenant promises. 
If the big theme of the Bible is God's covenant, is God's covenant, it's obvious that God includes the children of believers in his covenant promises. They belong. And so we bring up our children in that framework. That God has said, I will be your God and you will be my people and I will be the God of your children. We, we teach them to pray, don't we? Our Father who is in heaven. We say to the, them, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We, we know that election takes place within the covenant community. It's no guarantee that no covenant child will ever walk away from the gospel. Please don't misunderstand me. That's never been the case. We know that right from the start, there was an Ishmael as well as an Isaac. Both received the covenant sign of circumcision. There was Esau as well as a Jacob. Both were covenant children. And so we know that tragically there are children that trample on the promises and the privileges of the covenant. And yet the promise stands firm. And we cling to it. And we bring up our children, to use the words of William Still, in faith and not fear. We rest on God's perfect, consistent, unfailing character. And so our children are to be nurtured and instructed to trust the Lord Jesus and to live holy lives, to be brought up in the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Deuteronomy 4, 6 to 10, and Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 10 give us the parental role of spiritually teaching our children. We're to teach them diligently. Talk when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you, when you rise. And, and we know that parents have the primary, primary role in spiritually teaching their children. And that role of teaching is to be as comprehensive, covering all of life. Now I want to move on and talk about how does God communicate with his covenant people? How does God speak and strengthen his covenant people? And the answer is through his word and through his sacrament. That is obvious. We are given means of grace. And we believe that God has ordained the means of communicating the gospel and pressing home Christian obedience. And they are by the preaching of God's word and the sacraments. So as you read scripture, and particularly you, you see it in example, for example, in the book of Acts, you see preaching being used by God in a mighty way. It's reinforced by 1 Corinthians 1.21, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The gospel is also preached through the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper. They are visible signs, aren't they, of God's promises and the gospel. Let me read you three very helpful um, questions from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? The answer is here. The outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, the sacraments, and prayer all of which are made effectual, effective to the elect for salvation. And so here's what I really want you to note. How is the word made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God makes the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith and to salvation. And so then, how is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? That the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Receive it with faith and love. Lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. So it is as the word of God is preached by the man of God, which I think is a technical title that is given to us in the pastoral epistles, as the word of God is preached by the man of God to the worshipping people of God, God speaks and God strengthens his people. There is a difference when somebody who is gifted by God to be a preacher of the word of God 
there is a difference than even a small group Bible study, even one-to-one, even a Sunday school teacher. When the man of God who's been gifted and equipped by God to preach to the people of God. And so as we gather to worship, the high point is as we hear the word of God. And so it is natural that we want our children to participate in that. To be there. To see their parents hearing and responding to the word of God pressed home to them in preaching. For this to be a natural experience for them as they grow up. And we recognize that that requires work. It requires a degree of sacrifice from parents as they train their children to sit still and listen. It requires the preacher to consider children as a vital part of their congregation. And to grow in our ability to communicate with them. Not just adults. It requires patience and understanding on the part of the rest of the church family. So let me move on to what does the Bible say about regarding children in worship? Are there biblical examples? And it seemed to me from the biblical data that children were normally present in times of worship during the Old Testament. Exodus 12, they're present at the Passover, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Exodus 12, 24, we're told that the Passover is for you and your descendants. And as we read further, we read that children were being present and it stirred up curiosity and the children were to ask, what does this ceremony mean? Deuteronomy shows us at the renewal of the covenant, we find children are not only present, but little ones. Deuteronomy 29, 10 to 13. You go to chapter 31, the end of the book, at the reading of the law, and the whole community are assembled in order that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord, Moses tells them. Verse 12 and um, 13 of Deuteronomy 29, assemble the people, the men, the women, and the little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law. And that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. It's noteworthy, isn't it? The whole community, the whole community, including children and little ones, were expected to be there. But they were also expected to hear and to learn. The pattern's repeated in John, uh, Joshua 8.35 and 2 Chronicles 20 verse 13. And in that latter passage, you'll find Jehoshaphat calling for fasting and prayer. And not only does he call for children to be present, but he goes one step further to speak of children and little ones, to imply that it included children of a very young age. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. You go to Ezra where the people confess their sins, and that includes children who were present. You come to Jesus' ministry, And the parents bring their children to Jesus. They carry them. It's babies and infants to hear him and meet him. And Jesus welcomes them with open arms. In Mark 10, 14, Jesus is indignant with those who try to keep little children from him. And so we're all familiar, aren't we, with Jesus teaching huge crowds on a number of occasions. But what's often overlooked is that the crowds included men, women, and children. In the account of the feeding of 5,000, where Jesus has been healing and teaching, in Mark 6, 30 to 43, and Matthew 14, 13 to 21, we're told that there were not only 5,000 men, but women and children also. And this is important, that when you come to the New Testament epistles, and when the church is, is addressed by the Apostle Paul in his letters to the Ephesians and Colossians, he directly addresses children. He speaks to them. Paul's assumption is that the children of believers will be there in the assembled people of God. The letters were intended to be read and expounded. It's only fair to assume children would have been present when the churches met to hear Paul's letters read. And so I want to argue theologically and biblically, children are part of the covenant people of God. They are included. Your children, if you are a believer, have as much right to be under the preaching of God's word as anyone else. Now let me try and finish with some objections. So first of all, children don't understand sermons and it goes over their heads, we're told. That's often fair enough. I'd argue it's the same with adults. 
And so first of all, we need to realize what is happening in corporate worship when we gather as the people of God to call on the name of God. So when we meet together to worship God, we we realize not everybody will understand everything that goes on. The outsider who has come in, we're delighted he's there, his or her mind is darkened. They, They will not understand what is going on as the people of God worship. Let's say an international student who comes to church, his English is not great, he will grasp some things, but he won't understand everything. The child who loves the illustrations, but struggles to fully grasp the doctrine, well, that's like many adults. What, what is key? It's that the international student and the child grasp that as the people of, gather, people of God gather to worship, they are engaging with God. The child who recognizes this will, as the outsider did in 1 Corinthians 14, 25, have the secrets of their hearts disclosed. And so falling on their face will worship God and declare God is really among you. Isn't that what we desire as we gather to worship on the Lord's day? There is something mysterious. There is something, can I say, supernatural that goes on when the people of God meet together to call on God's name. And so when we pray for the Lord's Day, our great desire should be that we, as a whole church covenant community, meet with God, that we'd know his presence, we'd hear his voice. And we must long for our lives to be changed by a dynamic encounter with God. And we also need to know that children, though they may understand less in quantity, we do know that children have a great capacity to accept what they hear as truth. Indeed, Jesus calls on you and I to have childlike humility, to have faith like little children. And I think if you're taking children out of worship because they don't understand, you have to then, by necessity, take out someone who has language difficulties, somebody who has additional learning needs. I'm not sure anyone advocates that. At least I hope they don't. What about the argument that says children are noisy and distract parents as well as others? And again, we have to say that that objection in some ways is fair enough. Uh, But firstly, I'd want to say this. As a preacher, adults are noisy and distract others too. We recognize children are different from one another and have different needs. And it does take training. No one's denying that. There's a need for congregations to bear with parents and little ones. But to have children in worship is such a privilege. It should be fine to have patience with them. I often say to people at IPC, we need to accept that there will be a low level of background noise. That's okay. Psalm 8 tells us that out of the mouths of babes and infants, God has ordained praise. And there's all sorts of noises coming out of the mouths of babes and infants. Elders, families, particularly older godly women who've experienced the frustrations of sometimes trying to control children within worship. They are the ones to gently and humbly give advice and help. It may be that there are those within the congregation that can sit with larger families and help the children and help the parents. We have a crash where tiny ones go for a short time. Those who are struggling uh, can go with their parents and sit and, and watch the sermon and listen to the sermon in another room. A kind of training room is helpful. Interestingly, we have found that visitors and non Christian parents who come don't find it off-putting in the slightest. We have a little card that we give to visiting families to introduce um, them to our children being in worship. Third objection, children want to be with other kids their own age. They don't like staying in. It's boring. Now, I think we do need to, as churches, provide age-specific discipleship. I think there are other opportunities for that. Uh, We have Sunday school before the service. We have a club for children and young people during the week, seeking to teach them the gospel and disciple them. Churches need to assist and help families with teaching and discipling their children, particularly in the area of doctrine. But as for the point that staying in church is boring, that says far more, doesn't it, about the adults than it does about the children. There is a duty on those of us who are preachers and leading in worship to keep children in mind. 
In our congregation, we have sheets for the children which are given out in the hymn before the sermon. But in our preparation, we must think through the application of our sermons and have children in our minds for making application. I think it does mean that we need to keep a handle on how long our services are. And preachers need to be on the right side of the half-hour mark, if they can be. Let me close by speaking to parents. Let me plead with you to prepare your children for worship on the Lord's Day morning. To speak and pray with them before they go to bed on Saturday evening. To speak excitedly of the Lord's Day. To make the Lord's Day a day of joy and of fun. To do the best things uh, on a Sunday as a family. Before you go to church, read the passage with them. Encourage them. Pray for the preacher on the Lord's Day and during the week. And in church, your children get to see you engaging with worship, singing the hymns heartily, hearing God's word, confessing your sin, receiving the assurance of pardon. Your children get to join you in prayer and confess the creed together. And they hear you, they see you hearing God's word and receiving the sacrament. Let's be honest, there are bad weeks, aren't there? I say that as a parent. There are times when your children are in bad form. That's okay. There are times when you are in bad form and don't listen as you should. During the week, take opportunities to speak of the prayer of confession that you joined in. Speak about the sermon. Try and apply it in family worship. We don't do it perfectly. None of us do. But as our children see us delighting in God's word and God's people... So as our children see us loving his church, loving the Lord, loving the preaching of the word, that will have an enormous effect on our children. Help them to see that they are part of the people of God, that they are loved here, they are welcome here, and the promise is for you and your children and all who are afar off. Frame your life as a family with the covenant of God, that I will be your God and the God of your children.